is I'll be actually put these on and I will have a chat. Uh, the chat line is on as well. So thank you all for joining. Um, just a couple words just briefly about this uh, seminar. If it's your first time joining me, I'm here in Rome. I'm Darius Aria. I direct the American Institute for Roman Culture. And uh, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel where all of these seminar conversations will be uh, added. Uh, that's We Dig Rome on YouTube. You can get it all also in ancientromelive.org, which also has text and photos and, and a lot more content. And on Wednesdays, I'm doing this seminar for kids. And on uh, Sundays, uh, we're talking to everybody, including kids, but also the big kids. Um, so what's going to happen down the road is we're, once we get out of our lockdown in Italy, we'll be going to more museums and sharing more content. We have a lot of partnerships we're really excited about. And right now, it's really about just engaging you and talking to you about history, uh, whether it be the History Bites, which I do every day on Instagram Story, or uh, here in these seminars, or on Twitter, and the whole digital team that's active on Facebook, Twitter, and uh, Instagram. But again, those History Bites are on Instagram. Please join in on those every, uh, every day at 5 p.m. today. I'll, I'll be a little bit later. Let me close that door, please. Now, um, the, today's topic is about plagues and pestilences, which have been recorded for a long time uh, and antiquity. And of course, um, and of course, uh, we're going to be able to go all the way back to the Iliad. Uh, and we have one of the first cases of the uh, pestilence transferring from, uh, the time, from animals into people. So we have very old records of people recording in the past how disease is spreading. Not necessarily, of course, uh, successful outcomes uh, for people, but already that's a big case in antiquity. Now that's number one. I'm going to have to pause. All right, so as long as everyone can hear me, I'd love to hear a yes, to make sure we're all on the same page, that I'm not just talking to myself. Great, all right. Now, yes. um, all right, yes. great. But let's keep, yes. uh, let's keep yes. uh, the audio yes. off. <laughs> Otherwise, it's gonna be too crazy. All right, thank you very much. Really appreciate that. That's really exciting uh, that you're all here. So, we go from the Iliad, we can go to Thucydides, uh, in the Peloponnesian War in the 5th century, we have a great example of a discussion, an analysis of the plague that breaks out. We can jump into Rome and we can go to the 5th century when in 433 BC, there is a plague and the Romans ask the gods for help. And who is the god that's famously warding off the plague? Is Apollo. He either brings the plague like in the, the Iliad or he can take it away. So they vow a temple to him, and it is going to be built shortly thereafter, after the plague ends. And that's in the 430s BC, later built in the Augustan period as the temple of Apollo Socianus. Let's jump forward again to the famous plague that leads to the invitation of Asclepius, the son of Apollo, who has a famous sanctuary at that time by, um, uh, in Epidaurus, in what we call Greece, and the result is that they bring back the God manifested in the snake from the sanctuary. And that snake famously slithers off the boat on the Tiber River and comes ashore on the Tiber Island. Now, this is a great place to have a sanctuary of healing because everyone knew, as we know today as well, keep the sick in isolation, keep the sick away from the rest of the general population. And that is exactly what is done. So every time here someone's saying, uh, what, what, what plague was that? We don't know. We don't know. We're guessing because we don't have a rich archaeological record that uh, can uh, underscore what the people are describing the literary sources. So we know there's something that breaks out. We know that there's a pestilence. We know that there's something that's affecting a lot of people. People, what do you do in time of dire need? You pray to the gods. You also look for a solution. So they bring back a god who's going to help them, Asclepius. They give him a temple. Now, it's not by chance that in the Christian period, in the 15th century, you have a hospital there that's created, Fatima and Fratelli, uh, which is still standing today 
And I will underline, just bringing it back to today, I went to a part of that hospital today and I donated blood. So what you did in antiquity, what you did was you isolated the people. They knew this in the Middle Ages. They knew this in uh, the Renaissance. They knew it in antiquity. Didn't always exactly carry it out as well as they could have, but uh, that's a common factor through observation. You keep those people away, leprosy or whatever the pestilence was. And that uh, phenomenon continues today. And I just want to throw out then, bringing it to our present uh, predicament here in Italy and much of the world, if you can make a contribution to your local community, do so in whatever way you can. And one way that a lot of people are saying in the United States, in Italy, and everywhere is that there is a shortage of blood. So that's something that one can do. And, and I'm you know, living here and I'm connected to history and literally down the street is Fate Bene Fratelli where I was able to make uh, a contribution. So just keep that in mind, bringing it uh, to today. Now, going back to ancient times, I want to focus specifically uh, for the rest of the conversation in, uh, on the Antonine Plague. And why do we call it the Antonine Plague? It's because it's breaking out in the time of one of the Antonine rulers, who is uh, Marcus Aurelius, from the 160s to 180. Let's just think for a second. Let's give a little background. So we know a lot about the archaeology and the archaeology of the second century AD. And we know that aside from the, the forum spaces, the temples, the marble, the brick face uh, constructions, the palace of the emperors, the garden estates surrounding the city, Rome in particular, this great mega metropolis that we're so proud of, I'm so excited about, um, it was overcrowded. It was full of urban poor, you know, and we don't have them writing down their predicaments. We get some passages from authors like Marshall and Juvenal. We know that many of them were sickly and malnourished. We know that from uh, some of the analysis that's picking up in uh, archaeological studies, the DNA analysis and so forth, we're getting a better idea about the actual condition of people. We know they had hardships. We know that the life expectancy was maybe, if we're lucky, 45, 50 years old. We know that there's a huge infant mortality rate. We knew the sanitary realities weren't so great that most people were living in apartment buildings, going to the bathroom in chamber pots and throwing them out into the street. So you have that kind of a reality. We have baths, hot, packed with people, ill, not ill. Uh, and we actually have a famous passage from this gentleman, Marcus Aurelius, in his meditations. One of the passages I want to read to you about the baths is he says, what do the baths bring to your mind? Oil, sweat, dirt, greasy water, and everything that is disgusting. Such then is life in all its parts, and such is every material thing in it. So we know what the reality of the baths are. We know that it was teeming with all kinds of potential uh, diseases. We know that the Roman cities were big, and people were coming from all over the empire to Rome. Of course, Rome itself is always malarial. Rome itself is being flooded all the time. That leads to pestilence, that leads to famine, that leads to hardships. Rome in antiquity always lived with malaria. And Rome was connected to the rest of the empire. So you had the great road systems, you had uh, the sea trade routes, and you had this opportunity then for a back and forth and flow of ideas, people, uh, goods, also disease. And I don't want to give the Romans too much of a hard time because let's say that the Antonine Plague is the first big plague really that's on the historical record that we can identify with. We get a sense of how big it was. It didn't happen before to that extent. So you can look at new recent scholarship. They were getting lucky. Something was going to happen to them sooner or later. They were just buying their time. It was a ticking time bomb. So different ways in which we can look at ancient Rome in the same way we can look at ourselves as well, that we have this horrible plague in 1918, the Spanish flu, and then when's the next pandemic? So have we been biding our time? Have we been careless? Have we not prepared enough? Have we not uh, been in tune to the realities of one day this is going to happen again? Meantime, we have this great airline traffic and cheap flights and people are traveling all over the place and sharing images and being excited about traveling and discovering the world. The world is a smaller place, We're all connected. That's kind of the reality that happens in the second century AD, is that it is easy to go throughout the Mediterranean. 
and it is easy for then ultimately disease to spread, to spread thoroughly through the empire and to spread very quickly. How a much of an influence, so how does it really uh, happen is uh, Lucius Verus, who is the co-ruler of Marcus Aurelius, is fighting a war against Parthia. So he's all the way in the east. And as they win, there is the outbreak that takes place. So beyond where the Romans are, so in Parthia or even further east, they're contracting this disease and they're bringing it west. That seems to be what all the sources are uh, referring to. Potentially Varus himself dies. And of course, this outbreak is very bad and it's affecting everybody. And the famous source that we have uh, is going to be um, Dio Cassius in uh, his life from 155 to 235, estimating 2,000 deaths per day in Rome with the height of the outbreak. That's just an estimate. How can we corroborate, corroborate it with, with the archaeological evidence? It's very difficult to do so. But what we can do is we can talk about the military impact, the economic impact, and the religious impact. Let me look at some questions. Um, We'll hold off on the Justinian plague. We need the Justinian plague another time. Uh, what I'm talking about, going back to the third century BC, that's referring to some sort of pestilence that brings in um, Asclepius from Epidaurus to Rome. Are there good sources about the plague that will be accessible to high school Latin teacher, students? Yes, absolutely. And when these videos go up, they're going to include written material, summary of the conversation, as well as where to go, things that you can access online very easily. What evidence is there of food sources being compromised concurrently with the Antonine Plague? Well, funny you should mention it. The big source that we have about that is the grain reforms under Commodus. So I'm kind of jumping the gun here a little bit, but we'll do it because the time is short. The plague breaks out. Marcus Aurelius is, is the sole emperor after Varus dies. He's fighting against the Germans. He's having an awful time. Shortage of troops and so forth he has to hire a lot of people, has to conscript a lot of, uh, you know, Germans, uh, some of the provinces themselves, even gladiators coming out of slavery. These are dire times. And the result ultimately is he's going to adopt Commodus as his co-ruler in his last years of his reign. Marcus Aurelius dies. Commodus is taking over in, in 180, and Commodus has to deal with the fallout. People are hoarding grain. He's got to ensure that people don't starve. And he has to have a firm grip on how kind of reform of the whole grain system, how grain is coming to Rome and the rest of the empire. Who's stockpiling? We don't want to have the prices go high, sky high and so forth. So that's kind of answering what evidence is there of food sources being compromised? Grain is the fundamental food source. It seems that the aqueducts of malfunction malaria would have been worse. Yes, that is absolutely correct. The aqueducts were in use all through antiquity, all the way into late antiquity. So the aqueducts at this time were working, and that's probably one of the main reasons why Rome wasn't falling apart with disease and pestilence all the time. So much fresh water was coming into the city. Keep checking ancientromelive.org for new content each week. Absolutely. How long did the, death, uh, the plague last? What was the death toll? So we're always focusing today on the Antonine Plague. The estimate, and these are more like guesstimates, is in the millions. And you, you can go online and, and, and check this out and guess which are like 4 million, 5 million. So imagine it's an empire of 60 million people, 60 million people, just how many people would have died. And the estimate is everyone's losing somebody in the family. The realities are very harsh for the first five years of life. The realities are harsh. People don't live that long. People are serving in the military. Think of all the different ways in people's lives could be compromised and not living a long life. This was something extra. And who do we turn to? Who do we turn to? We're going to turn to um, Galen. And Galen is the kind of a rock star physician who's alive at the time. He's from uh, Pergamon and he makes his way to Rome and he's self funded. And he uh, becomes ultimately for his good work, his astute work, he becomes the uh, emperor's uh, own personal physician. So he's a, he's a person who um, is going to be able to give us lots of information. But again, what's the reality of Rome at the time? There's a lot of easy international travel. Uh, we have uh, assessments of the baths. Lots of great scholarship on that, how dirty they actually were. There's no chlorine. A lot of water was sitting there forever and scummy and greasy, as Marcus Aurelius himself says. 
There's a lot of tapeworm, a lot of lice, not so clean. Um, and, and ultimately, this is the first you know, pandemic that you have recorded uh, in antiquity. And possibly, it flares up again and is recognized as being the plague of Cyprian in 249 and 262. So this is something that seems to be recurring. What is the disease in and of itself? What is it? Yeah, a huge petri dish is a great way to describe the crowded conditions of Rome. And of course, Rome is connected to other mega cities of the time, the empire. It's going to spread like wildfire. There were public fountains. There were a, a, a flowing water all throughout the city of Rome in particular, but everyone doesn't have in their house. You're going to communal areas, you're drawing the water and so forth. Uh, so there are a lot of factors and a lot of ways in which this disease is spreading very quickly. But a neat thing that our friend Galen says is, once you got it, you were immune. And he describes the conditions that people got. So over three weeks or so, you get fever, diarrhea, pharyngitis. So your, your throat is, if you're having problems uh, breathing, then you get the pustules on the skin, sometimes dry, sometimes full of pus, and then uh, ultimately they can dry off if you survive uh, and kind of they get scabby and fall off and so forth. So what is this disease? Is it smallpox? Is it measles? We're not getting a real uh, answer into that. I did a podcast with a friend of mine who's an expert in this field, and that podcast will be coming out soon. His name is Francesco Galassi. He's a great great um, uh, person in the field that has analyzed the remains, the human remains, skeletal remains uh, of people from millennia ago. So uh, look out for that podcast that will be coming to you soon. Um, but I love the questions that are coming as well. And, um, and, uh, and I'm hoping I'm, I'm giving you what you guys are asking for. So as the death, as you're doing the plague, do people start to question the current ruler of the time? Absolutely. I mean, it's a real low point. And actually, I wanted to give you something about religion. Because when things go bad, and things were going really bad, one of the aspects is religion. So we do see a rise in Christianity at this time. Are people looking at new outlets, new gods, new help? Um, and if the gods don't help, then you're in big trouble. So Marcus Aurelius is praying specifically to Apollo. We already we established that array in the beginning. From the Iliad to Rome, you pray to Apollo. He's the god of the pestilence. And sure, there's a sleep is, but you really are praying to Apollo to stop the pestilence. And one particular manifestation of Apollo in a town called Claros in Western Turkey, the oracle says, this is what you got to do. The relationship with the gods is out of whack. You've done some things. Correct it. So sacrifices is this, it's that. And um, that's one avenue that you're going to have the emperor go. Another oracle of Alexander of Abunotekos in northwest Turkey has a snake called Glycon. And Glycon speaks to Alexander, and Alexander then speaks to the emperor and everybody else. And says, this is what you got to do. This is how you end the plague. This is how you're going to deal with that German revolt. And so famously, um, one of the things that he says is, throw some lions into the Danube. Okay. So people are desperate and we're looking at some very interesting things. Um, oh, so the podcast is still yeah, traveling to YouTube. It's, it's, uh, that's going to be coming out the season two very shortly. History repeats itself. What do people learn from all these plagues and how do they change behavior? Oh my goodness. Um, well, you know, it looks like some people are turning to other gods. Some people are turning to uh, the Christian God. Um, it's ultimately a very difficult time and there has to be some sort of regrouping but there's an impact on the economy of the Roman Empire, on trade and numbers in the empire and the military. So let me read your passage from our friend uh, himself, Marcus, about, about Marcus Aurelius in his time. This is from the Scriptura Historia Augusti, uh, which is a biographies of late Roman, a collection of biographies of uh, emperors written in Latin. And so we're told that um, with the pestilence that breaks out, the Roman ceremony of the Feast of the Gods was celebrated for seven days, and there was such a pestilence besides that the dead were removed in carts and wagons. So this is one thing that's being told uh, when uh, Marcus Aurelius is getting ready to go against the Germans. Let's have a big celebration, uh, religious ceremonies and so forth, purify the city. This is what you did in antiquity. Everyone comes out, everyone prays, makes offerings to the gods, and so forth. Uh, is Apollo the god, a god of medicine, sun, poetry, healing? Yep, at illness, at pestilence. 
and pestilence. Uh, was the plague and pestilence used as propaganda? I mean, well, definitely the question is, when Marcus Aurelius is dealing with this, you know, he doesn't want to revolt on his hands. He needs people to get with it. He needs to get everyone together with the program. And the program was to go defend the borders because the Germans were attacking on the Danube. And then it was to stabilize life in Rome. And you have treatment by uh, physicians, of course, there's Galen himself, but you're doing the best that you can. Again, that one observation that people that did live through the disease were immune. I mean, that's what we're always looking at, hopefully to the viruses, including the new virus. If you get it, you won't get it again. Therefore, now you're a survivor. Therefore, now you can easily help other people and so forth. Okay. So he revived, uh, again, the, uh, since the pestilence was still raging at this time, this is another passage, he both zealously revived the worship of the gods and trained slaves for military service, just as had been done in the Punic War. I called, uh, he armed gladiators, uh, he turned bandits of Dalmatia and Dardania into soldiers, he armed all these people and hired auxiliaries from the Germans for service against Germans, and besides all this, he proceeded with all care to enroll legions for the Marcomannic and German War. And lest this prove burdensome for the provinces, this is, this is cool, he held an auction of the palace furnishings in the form of the deified Trajan and sold besides robes and goblets and golden flagons, every, even statues and paintings by great artists. So he did a massive fundraiser. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, it was Galen the doctor in Fauci. <laughs> That's one way, I suppose, of looking at it. Um, it's... It's, 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 it's tough times. We have learned so much. We have um, antibiotics, we have treatment, we have modern science, we have great things at our disposal today that they did not have. What was medicine like in antiquity? And Galen was a genius, and he probably dissected bodies and all this sort of stuff. He really got to understand that medium vivisection. He understood how the body worked. He was, he was not surpassed, surpassed for maybe a thousand years. So they did great things in antiquity, they had great minds, but they don't have the knowledge that we have. They're able to do what we have. They don't have the technology that we have. So we have game changers now and we can be quick about it and we can communicate to people and people can be educated very quickly and we can give them good direction. So there are things that we have at our disposal today that they did not have. But the panic is there, the fear is there, the number of people dying because of a major outbreak is there. Um, so we have to really keep these things in mind. But of course, I think we're living in a much uh, better time. The revolt, we're saying we're talking about the Germans. Exactly. So that's a big thing. Large conversion uh, Christianity. I mean, it's around that time period. It's hard. It's kind of circumstantial. So we have to be careful about that kind of, uh, that kind of questioning. Again, we don't, we don't even know from Galen. It's a smallpox or measles or what, and I'll leave to the experts to argue about that. But definitely uh, something bad was there. And it seems to be something like a measles or a smallpox. Um, let me tell you how Marcus Aurelius died. It seems like he succumbs to it. He died in the following manner. When he began to grow ill, he summoned his son, and that's commonest, and besought him first of all not to think lightly of what remained of the war, lest he seemed a traitor to the state. And when his son replied with his first desire was, that his first desire was good health, he allowed him to do so as he wished, only asking him to wait a few days and not leave at once. Then being eager to die, he refrained from eating or drinking, and so aggravated the disease. On the sixth day, he summoned his friends, and with derision for all human affairs and scorn for death, he said to them, why do you weep for me? Instead of thinking about the pestilence and about death, which is the common lot of us all. So that is Marcus Aurelius, that's a quote. He's the one who has the meditations. He's a stoic philosopher, ruler, seems to be a decent guy. And he's the one who has to deal with this outbreak. Commodus has to pick up the slack. Commodus does deal with reforming uh, the grain um, influx into Rome, punishing people that are hoarding it. So he does a lot of good things in reforming and so forth. This is also Commodus who ultimately likes to dress like a gladiator. This is Commodus who in the movie Gladiator was killed by uh, another gladiator and so forth. Not true. Uh, I mean, he is killed by a gladiator, but not in the way in which uh, we see in the movie. It's a phenomenal movie. I think it does give you a sense of some of the visceral uh, realities, gritty uh, harshness of the Roman world. We don't really talk about pestilence per se, but everyone we can see in antiquity was dealing with pestilence on and off. 
How did people bathe in Rome? Well, you could go to the baths, and that was something that was offered free to you, but potentially you could also get sick. But again, if these baths were just, you know, laboratories of, of, of pestilence and, and plague, how come this wasn't happening all the time? So there had to be some decent benefits of that system, of the uh, Roman baths, the aqueducts, the fountains, the water flow, the cleaning of the cities. Otherwise, people would be dying left and right. But this is like maybe another perfect storm of what it was in antiquity. It happened, and we record it, and it was devastating. Frequency was possibly daily. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and it was a part of life, and it was a part of uh, being able to socialize with your friends and work out and have a bite to eat and get a rub down if you could afford it and so forth. Uh, any assassination attempts during this time uh, due to the plague or rebelling to the sword? Yeah, the big one that we've been talking about is the revolt in Germany. That's the one that's going to occupy Marcus Aurelius to, to his death. Is there any speculation on the hoarding of grain was linked to plague outbreaks, which might, etc.? So, um, uh, which might uh, point to a, a rodent source or plague? I don't think there's so much an issue of there not being enough grain. It's simply that people start to hoard it. People keep it for themselves. And the state says, "No, we are guaranteeing this." We don't want the price to spike. So think about like, like kind of like the stock market or something like that. We don't want any price gouging. Like today, I mean, you don't want any price gouging for the, you are, um, you are isolating yourselves from other people. You're going to spend time at home with your family. You're not going to associate with other people. That's what we're doing today. That's what we're encouraged to do. And you need to have food and the basic things to stay alive for maybe weeks. So we don't want people running and buying out the whole grocery store. Then the state has to say, hey, we're going to make sure everyone has grain. When you video tours apartment blocks, it seems clear that people did not have kitchens. No, a lot of people actually right. They did have kitchens, but more often than not, if you couldn't afford, if you're just renting a, a, a loft space above your shop, you went out to eat and you went to the, the, the bars, you know, which is a prosciutto sandwich, which is uh, a drink, which is fruit or whatnot. But absolutely. And when we do look at the kitchens in the ancient Roman world, strangely enough for us, there's one central drain and it's for the kitchen work. And it's also oftentimes the toilet. So here you're putting, wait a minute, what about washing your hands? You know, what about this? You know, so the kids talk, we did talk about the uh, soap and how the Romans didn't really use soap so much as they used um, olive oil. Uh, so a lot of things that you can get out of the kids seminar and the question and answer from last Wednesday. Um, well, it's, I mean, look, no, nobody was really self-isolating per se. It just kind of went through the population. I mean, you know, that's, that's the realities of, of times in uh, antiquity, unfortunately. So uh, ask me some more questions. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm happy to answer your questions. This is about kind of where I want to keep it at about a half an hour because uh, it just takes so long to, to put up these videos and I don't have a great bandwidth here. Can't read you last Wednesday seminar. I looked on the website, I didn't see it. Maybe my fault. Okay, I, there's ancientromelive.org will have a dedicated page per video that we put up on YouTube. Uh, there, Warren, thank you so much, man. Uh, and he's our a digital manager. He has put it up right there for you, but it's gonna have a devoted page on Ancient Rome Live. Go to that video right now on YouTube, watch it, give us your feedback. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, we love so much that we're having these great conversations. I love the questions, it's absolutely wonderful. We have 113 people online at the moment, which is great. And it's, it's absolutely wonderful to, to speak with all of you, to have your interest, to see where you're dialing in from, not trying to make it, don't want this to be boring, we don't want this to be slow, we don't want this to be just a pre-recorded thing, we wanna do stuff live like this. We really appreciate that you guys are so interested. We thought ultimately that the Antonine Plague was very timely. Um, I do want to bring you through at some point to the, 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 the new discoveries in the Romans Forum. I want to talk about the lives of Augustus, because this is a guy that has multiple lives. Maybe for next week, we'll do that. We'll come back later on to the Justinian plague and things like that. But um, please do share the uh, short videos that we have. We have 100, 150 of them or so that are on. Hey there in Chicago, thank you so much. And all you guys as well, stay safe. Let me know where else you're from, because I really appreciate hearing where you are. We're on Twitter, and Periscope, Instagram, and, and so forth. And we really, really appreciate it. Thank you guys so much. And Ann Arbor and Dallas, and everyone, you know, I grew up in the States as well. So I'm, I'm there all the time. I want you guys also to take good care of yourself. Philly, in Atlanta, in the UK, 
And I love the analogies between then and now. It's so important. I think, hey, there in Miami Beach, Cincinnati, Canada. So thank you. Baton Rouge, New Jersey. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. So this will be up very shortly. Cheers in Poland. How you doing there? San Francisco, St. Louis. Thank you guys so much. Have a good one. Again, you can go to our YouTube channel. You can go to hmlive.org and you can follow us in, uh, you can follow us uh, on uh, at Save Rome and Twitter, Instagram, and also you can follow us on Facebook. You guys take care. Enjoy the rest of your weekend.